Even in the South, their hunting season is anticipated like football season. This is what most people think of when they think of whitetail deer hunting. Man, ban, you know, Bambi exists in sort of, Bambi exists as two things. It exists as a film from 1942 and what is it? I don't know, 80, 90 minutes long. I guarantee, I have three young kids, I guarantee if I put Bambi in front of my three young kids, they would probably watch it like they watch a lot of cartoons and they'd probably look like, mostly like it. Bambi exists as a metaphor for, for how many Americans view wildlife, which is they view wildlife um, at an individual level. Bambi and Bambi's mom, enjoying life in the forest when the hunter comes along to traumatize poor Bambi and subsequently generations of children. And what do you remember about Bambi? Nothing. Like, I, I remember Bambi's mom. That's it. A little girl deer running around in the field. So you think Bambi's a girl? Yeah, fully. Bambi's a boy? <laughs> Is it not? No, Bambi's a, Bambi's a boy. No, no, you're kidding. <laughs> but I, the main thing I remember is that the Bambi's mom had died. Old animation. You can't shoot a deer in the spring. It's also out of season, wouldn't it? I don't know. It looks like a girl to me. It's like the definition of big doe eyes. Bambi has spots, which mean he's a fawn, but I think this is too early in the year for a fawn to have been born. So that doesn't seem to match up for me. Oh, Bambi's mom's not there. Is it bad enough? Okay. I would never show my own child this. That's so sad. Why wouldn't you show it to them? Well, as a four-year-old, like, I do not remember Bambi's mom dying and then Bambi looking for its mom. I think of Bambi as an, um, maybe an unfortunate take on what a deer hunter is. It's like Wicked. So have you ever seen Wicked compared to Wizard of Oz? I feel like we need to tell the Bambi equivalent of Wicked. This is that story. No white-tailed deer hunters, no white-tailed deer. Bambi was released to theaters on August 21st, 1942, and the total white-tailed population in the United States was estimated to be at only 2.5 million deer, with states like Georgia, Kentucky, and Tennessee having deer populations under 3,000. By the 1960s, the white-tailed deer population in the U.S. reached 5 million, and proceeded upward until today, where we enjoy a booming whitetail population of over 30 million. That's more deer than at any time since Europeans arrived on the continent. In fact, many types of wildlife in the Southeast are more abundant than at any time in the last 400 years. So, it's true. Grandpa may have sat in a tree stand back in the day, but he wouldn't see him much because wildlife was scarce. So why do people believe there was more wildlife in the past than today? It's because they haven't studied history and they don't understand what we had to go through and basically hunt species nearly to extinction. First we should talk about what happened to the whitetail population. The whitetail population in America was decimated by guys like me. Had I been born in 1750, I imagine, I would have been drawn to the same occupation that a person like Daniel Boone was drawn to at the, in that same time frame, meaning he wanted to become a commercial hunter. And being a commercial hide hunter at the time meant you hunt deer. Um, they used to hunt deer and they would sell the hides for workwear. It's a little known thing that many people in the, 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 the first west or the Appalachian frontier, they ate bears and they wore deer. Those guys decimated deer populations, all kinds of regional extirpations. Yeah, it's kind of a, a sad history, you know, from the fur trade when uh, uh, colonial Americans were, were in this area and they started a market fur trade uh, with, with a lot of tribes, but the Cherokee were one of the biggest tribes and contributors to the fur trade that went to Europe. 
our culture changed. And from there, our relationship with white-tailed deer as well changed, and we ended up uh, decimating these populations along with the colonial Americans. Well, I mean, as we always say, white-tailed deer are like a conservation success story. You know, back in the early 1900s, we had a lot of over-harvest, the market hunting, and uh, since we had the Pittman-Robertson Act, a lot of conservation measures in the 40s, 50s, 60s, we've really seen an increase throughout the entire U.S. Um, and the same is true for Florida. So what's responsible for this wildlife rebound? This guy, the white-tailed buck. And this winsome lady, the white-tailed doe. The white-tailed population is very strong in America today. We're somewhere between 28 and 30 million animals, which uh, is, is, is pretty high relative to where we've been in the last decade or so. So uh, good numbers of animals across the white-tails range and, and an extremely good age structure on both the bucks and doe side probably the most balanced or, or the best age structure we've had in at least the last 150 years. So when you're out looking around, you wanna look for a couple of things. You wanna make sure you have plenty of vegetation. So I'm from Miami and a lot of my outdoors experience has been on the water, like with kayaks and with the ocean and on boats, but I've never been like exposed really to the world of hunting. The little path that's cut through there, that's just from the yeah. animals walking back and forth. I started hunting about 15 years ago. I did not grow up around guns or hunting. Um, and I started by learning how to shoot a shotgun. I shot clays and um, loved it. And after I started shooting clays, somebody invited me to go on a bird hunt. I went on a bird hunt, which was very similar to shotgun, um, you know, clay target shooting. And that led to something else. And ultimately I was able to uh, go on a deer hunt and I've been hooked ever since. If I told my friends and family that I was learning how to hunt, they would literally be so shocked. Um, my friends would be like, who are you, Scarlett? I don't even know you anymore. My family would be so confused. Um, I'm like the princess of my family, so it's very strange for me to be hunting. <laughs> I think that was a bullseye. Okay. But again, there's nothing loaded here right now, and this is called a bolt action. So this is the bolt, and once we load the once we load the cartridges in, we'll lock this in, and that will push one of the bullets up and make it ready to go. Gotcha. Got a scope here. So with the scope, you're going to look through. Once we get this all situated, we're going to look through this. It's going to magnify out, and we're going to shoot at that first target of the circle right past that first big tree, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> that was my fault too. All good. So, bolt, forward, mm -hmm. down, hot. Okay. It's ready. It's ready. If you've only seen deer in your backyard, you may be surprised to learn that big bucks also mean big bucks for our local economies. Welcome to the Bass Pro Shop's Granddaddy Store in Springfield, Missouri. This 500,000 square foot palace is part outdoor retail wonderland and part shrine to American wildlife. Over 4 million people visit each year. Each year, Deer hunters represent a significant economic driver in the Southeast, spending $8.8 .8 billion chasing those elusive animals. Tree stands, food plot seeds, bows, scent remover, scent attractant, jackets, pants, trail cameras, range finders, mapping apps, and seemingly anything in that blaze orange. For the past five decades, Bass Pro Shops, under the leadership of Johnny Morris, has had conservation at its core, at its heart of who the company is. We see the outdoors as a uniter. 
Whether you hunt or fish, the outdoors has something for everybody. So in the southeastern region alone, deer hunting benefits the economy by producing approximately $609 million in state and local tax revenues. Pursuit of whitetail deer supports over 209,000 jobs in the southeast and $2.1 billion in federal and state taxes. Deer hunting is definitely king when it comes to all the species that can be hunted. About 80% of anybody that buys a hunting license is going to hunt deer and the next species isn't very close. So it's just significantly higher percentage of hunters that are going to pursue deer more than any other species. I think most hunters would be surprised by how much money they actually spend. They, don't, they probably don't fully realize the amount. Um, the typical hunter spends nearly $3,300 a year on hunting. Some people think I'm Steve Irwin. Some people think I'm a paper pusher. Some people think that I am, you know, overpaid government worker. But for us, we are stewards of the resource in the state. For us, we're trying to promote healthy deer across the state. Uh, we're collecting data, we're in the field doing analysis and surveys. We can be crunching numbers and, and computer analysis. Um, we can be working with universities and, and private consulting companies on research, all to go into managing this resource. That's not just hunting guides and property managers, but biologists, foresters, app developers, content creators, writers, and documentary narrators. In total, about 688,000 people have jobs because of hunters' expenditures. These jobs, many of them directly support hunters. It could be guides, it could be clerks at a hunting retail store. But a lot of these jobs are people who are working on the factory floor supplying supplies to hunters. It could be truck drivers delivering supplies to stores and more. But these jobs are found everywhere throughout the United States, urban areas, rural areas, and all 50 states. Deer hunting dwarfs all of the other species that we hunt. We know that about 79% of all hunters in the United States uh, pursue deer. So basically eight out of 10. Um, to give you an idea of just sheer numbers, there's between nine and 11 million deer hunters in the United States annually. Um, the second most hunted species are turkeys, and there's only about three million turkey hunters. We have about one and a half million duck hunters, um, and we have less than a million elk hunters. So I certainly enjoy chasing elk and uh, ducks and turkeys around, but if you add all of those hunters together, they still don't even equal half of the number of deer hunters that we have. But the impacts of white-tailed deer extend beyond sales and jobs, and often into America's farmland. Deer hunters pay for an amazing amount of land. Each year, deer hunters in the Southeast spend $991 million buying and leasing land for hunting. That amount of money dwarfs the budget of any conservation agency in the Southeast. Uh, but another thing that we, uh, that we see occur on the landscape is damage to agricultural crops. And if you look at the statistics for the U.S., there's uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in damages that occur to those, uh, those crops. So the large carnivores that we used to have on the landscape were an important part of that ecological system. And so without those uh, animals on the landscape, uh, to the, to the level that they used to be. Hunters have really re replaced those, those predators as the primary way that we ensure that deer populations exist at levels not only that are biologically sound so that they're not having an adverse effect on the other species that are out there, but also just in terms of um, the human side as well, making sure that the populations are low enough that we're not having an incredible amount of damage to personal property. Then, there's the property damage that comes with the rut as hormone-fueled deer rampage across America's countryside and suburbs, even committing a few home invasions along their way. Deer require approximately eight pounds of forage per deer per day, and that's a lot of vegetation across the landscape. If deer are left unchecked, then it can impact our vegetative quality for a number of other species that depend on that plant structure and composition. So some of the some of the issues that we can uh, that we deal with when we have overabundant deer populations is um, one would be deer vehicle collisions and I think a lot of people underestimate the the number of those um, that occur out there on the landscape especially during the fall during the breeding season during the rut when uh, particularly bucks are really active and moving a lot in search of does. Yeah. 
For perspective, that means human fatalities from deer collisions account for more deaths than shark, bear, wolf, and alligator attacks combined. My great-grandfather, Oscar Newcomb, would definitely be very surprised to know that white-tailed deer were responsible for killing 200 Americans every year, more than bears, wolves, gators, all this stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's a shocking statistic. If you look at the habitat destruction that happens from overpopulated deer herds, I mean, it's just everything, it can impact everything from other wildlife species and even water quality and the conditions of stream channels because of lack of vegetation, for example, to, to you know, to harness uh, runoff and water flows. So these are a lot of things that people never think about. Welcome to the Whitehall Deer Research Facility. We've had captive deer and a captive deer research program here since about 1968. And uh, we've been very fortunate to have a lot of leading deer researchers uh, use this facility to help uh, them with their deer research needs. I think it's really important that we study white-tailed deer and their habitats. Most of us can agree we've seen deer in our lifetime. We interact with them, whether it's on the roadways or out hunting. Agricultural producers interact with deer sometimes in a negative way in terms of crop depredation. So deer touch our lives, whether it's through transportation, the foods we eat, or the habitats that we use for production of tree resources. So they touch all Americans, whether they hunt or not. So studying these animals and understanding how we can most benefit from them and benefit habitats is really important work. So we've got 19 barn stalls where we can uh, house deer for um, you know whatever reasons. So people, a lot of people don't realize how expensive deer research can be. Again, only a, a portion of our research is done here. A lot of it's done out in the field. Um, we use this facility when we need a lot of experimental control. If we're doing um, research where we've got to collect a lot of physiological measurements, this is the place where we do it. You might see these reflectors. Several years ago, Georgia Department of Transportation came to us. They were interested in buying uh, several hundred thousand dollars worth of these reflectors uh, from a company that was selling them to state DOTs. And how they're supposed to work is you, you mount them at 100 feet intervals on both sides of the highway. And then as a car comes through, any deer that are on the sides of the road are, are supposed to be deterred from entering the roadway. And uh, they asked us, do these work? And we told them, you know, we don't really know if they'll work. We'll be glad to test them. So anyway, what that first experiment showed us, showed us was that, uh, yes, they cannot see into the reds. We were correct going into the experiment about that. But what we didn't know that this machine showed us is that they can see into the blues much better than we can. So in our industry, we know claims data shows that about one and a half million vehicle collisions a year are caused by deer. According to that claims data, those one and a half million collisions have caused the upwards of $1 billion in claims damages as a result. It's an enormous number. I think the biggest misconception about women in hunting is that women only hunt because somebody else wants them to, a boyfriend or a husband or a father. Um, but really, in reality, women like to hunt because they like to hunt. You did really well. First Thanks. time shooting ever. It's, it's always a little bit nerve wracking at first. But Definitely. Once you have the feel for it, just practice a little bit and get out in the field and you'll do just fine. Yeah, it was very exhilarating. It is, there's something very empowering about yeah. being able to shoot and to shoot a target. I really love trying new things. I love um, experimenting with new things and hunting is kind of like singing. You need to practice a lot to get perfect. Hey. Oh, this one's so much easier though. Isn't it? Yeah. It doesn't have a kickback. It kick doesn't back. have yeah. any kick at all. None. I think more women should hunt because it's a, a sport that anybody can do. There are no limitations on hunting. Nice. This feels a lot more stable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the standing is like, uh-uh. Yeah. It's hard. No. 
and there should never be any limitations on hunting. I think sometimes there's a little bit of a, uh, a, a stigma that women don't hunt or don't, women don't like to hunt and um, the more women that I see out in the field, um, the more they enjoy it and uh, they shouldn't be afraid to try. We all know something instinctively about hunting. From today's vegan to modern hunters, we're the genetic heir of countless generations of apex predators. So, man, the white-tailed deer back to the indigenous people in this country before white Europeans got here would have been massively significant to, to the tribes of Native Americans. I mean, they, they lived off white-tailed deer. It was a very accessible chunk of protein running around in the wild that was everywhere. And the stories that we hear about the, the numbers of, of white-tailed deer on this continent during that time is, it's, it's arguable how many white-tailed deer were here, but we're pretty certain that there are way more white-tailed deer today in North America than there was back pre-European civilization, which is wild. Historically tribes in Cherokee in particular, we know we used a, a lot of bow hunting to harvest white-tailed deer. And we still do that today. In fact, people, there's still quite a few people that still make their own bows and arrows and everything. And then some people use modern technologies, new bows, compound bows. But of course, uh, we do use rifles and we use any no new technology. We consider ourselves very adaptable. But the old way of thinking, where you only take what you need and you have to pay respect to these animals, because I, I value that those ways and I think that they're important for how we um, harvest and, and hunt our, uh, our deer populations now and value them. I believe hunting is a natural human behavior. Even in biblical times, in the book of Acts, it goes back to kill and eat. You know, when you think about um, the way that humans have always lived, it's, there's been fish, there's been meat, there's been, you know, um, everything that's in recorded history that we know, um, we have been hunters. You know, I think it goes back to, um, for tens of thousands of years, Humans are hunters and gatherers. I mean, at our at our most basic precept, that's what we do. You know, whether you choose to, to buy your meat from a grocery store or you choose to select your meat uh, from the outdoors, you, you're still a, a hunter or a gatherer. Um, and I think being an important part of the food web um, by being a hunter uh, is ingrained in us. It's not just a tradition, it's not just a sport. Um, but, but we are part of the animal kingdom. Uh, and being an important and active part of that food web is, is extremely important. A lot of tribes manage their own resources. And we do that uh, with over five, with 574 different tribes. Um, and we hold, because of there's so many tribes, we hold more land than a lot of other federal agencies do. We, we are a modern, um, independent nation. We have our own rules and laws. Uh, we have our own governments and uh, our own cultures, our own languages. The, the thing I do want folks to know is that we're still here and uh, we may not look like you thought from the movies, but, um, but we hold a significant amount of the management responsibility uh, for animals like white-tailed deer. In, in some respects, the modern American outdoorsmen, and I'm using men in the way that I mean guys, okay? The modern American outdoorsman was in some way created by, invented by the post-World War II years. Interestingly, my own dad, uh, he was brought up in the south side of Chicago. He was raised speaking English as a second language. He was, he was raised by Italian immigrants. The last thing out of his mind was going hunting when he was a little kid. But he went away and fought in World War II. And at that time, there was an editor, I believe maybe of Outdoor Life, who had made a comment that you can't train an entire generation of men to shoot and camp 
and not expect them to become hunters. That kind of created this modern American outdoorsman. I got introduced to hunting through my daddy, my grandpa, and my uncles. For about as long as I can remember, I was following along behind them through woods and fields. I used to get on the phone, like my dad would call, you know, back in the days of landlines. And at night during deer season, my dad would call his buddies. And I would say, hey dad, I'm gonna go get on the other end of the phone. And I would go to the back bedroom and get on the phone and, and not say a word ever. Just listen to them talk about deer hunting. And I, I just, I mean, I just soaked it up. And so my father was not a deer hunter simply because we didn't have a huntable population in the state for a number of years. And so when I was a teenager, I picked up a, a bow at a sporting goods store and I actually harvested a deer the first weekend I bought that bow. And my family didn't know what to do with the deer. And obviously we didn't have recipes, we didn't have field dressing techniques or skinning techniques, but it was a huge part of my youth, just going to the outdoors and having an outdoor adventure. Why do I think more women don't hunt? Um, sometimes it's not the most comfortable position to be put in to learn hunting from a male that might not be your father or uncle and to go out in the woods alone with an armed man and learn hunting. I mean, it, there are some obvious barriers there and sometimes women are not comfortable learning from a man that they're not comfortable with asking questions or um, being vulnerable and saying, I don't know how to do this. So I learned in the traditional manner, my dad taught me. And so um, I understood that it was okay for me to ask dad dumb questions, but not everybody got that opportunity. Here, so, yeah, I would put this up higher. Right there, Ooh. there, let's do it right there. How's that feel? That feels a little awkward. Okay. But we're doing it. So yeah. I try to pay it forward by, you know, taking other women and being it, uh, in a way that they can feel vulnerable and understand that it's okay to miss, it's okay to not know, it's okay to uh, just be in a learning atmosphere. And um, I, I really think that sometimes it just, it's because women don't have someone to teach them that they feel comfortable with. Folks in the wildlife management sphere, the game management sphere, do a lot of hand wringing about hunter numbers. And there's this, there's, many people will come and tell you that there's this meaningful decline in hunter participation, that the hunter is becoming an extinct species. We have today just about, now you can look at these little dips and rises and COVID did this and the 80s did that. Uh, we got about that many hunters now. It's been a, re I view it as a remarkably static number. We need deer hunters to reflect the population of the United States. And as a female deer hunter, uh, it's been my passion project to get other people that look like me or that don't look like a, a white male involved in the sport um, and get younger people involved in it. And so, I, you know, I've made the vow and many other has pledged to take somebody new with them every year and to take somebody that maybe doesn't look like them. I started being outdoors probably as soon as I was born because my mom and my dad actually got me involved. So um, my dad taught me to hunt. My mom is more of the fisher person. So they both had their equal parts in my outdoor life. The content creation part was my husband's idea actually. Um, I've been hunting and fishing for a very long time, was never really um, the social media person. But once he, we got together and he saw what I did, he was like, you know, this is something that we should be showing to the world, like, to get more people involved. So that's how it started. When I met my wife, we, uh, she actually told me that she hunted in and she fished, so I thought it was like pretty cool, um, me being from New York. And um, when we started discussing like going out and everything else, I thought it would be cool to actually document it. Because the first time I went uh, deer hunting, I told my family, and my family is composed with vegans and vegetarians. So I told him I was deer hunting. The first thing my sister said was, no, you're going to kill Bambi. I'm like, no, not Bambi. Bambi's dad, but not Bambi. 
My husband knew nothing about the outdoors, so I taught my husband how to hunt and fish. He had never been outside of the city. He had never seen a tree, so like everything outdoors was just so new to him. I think that that's actually helped us grow in our relationship as well because we're appreciating things together. Um, it's not just us sitting at home watching a movie or whatever it is. It's actually getting out, having these new experiences. Every time you sit in a deer stand, it's something new. Um, and I think that that's definitely helpful for us because we've learned to kind of adapt with each other. And, and that's one of my biggest goals because I don't want people to feel how I felt when I was younger, like, oh, I don't want people to see. I want them to see, like, oh, she hunts. I want to do that, too, if that's what I want to do. Like, I feel like we need that representation, and that's what, that's why we do it. I think it's important. Like, I do believe that people have, like, a stigma. They, they think hunter, and they think, like, you know, Bubba and some suspenders, and he's back in the backyard. And I think it's important for them just to be able to see themselves. Um, you know, again, I, I'm not Bubba, I don't have one suspenders, I'm from New York. Like, this is stuff that I've just gotten into, something I've learned to appreciate. And I think a lot more people need to learn that appreciation or at least know that aspect of it, opposed to having a negative connotation or thinking that it's for one type or group of individuals to be able to see that anyone can do it. Um, whether it's men, women, children, you know, race, it doesn't matter. It's just a matter of trying to get out there and getting everybody involved. Undoubtedly, by science, by, by any way that you can evaluate human life, any possible way, we are 100% predators that have been forced by the hand of the designer or by accident, if you think this place happened on accident. We have been forced by the architecture of human life to be hunters, predators, to consume meat. Our modern world is defined by waste, anxiety, and isolation. But hunting represents gratitude, patience, and community that many of us are seeking. I wish that non-hunters would understand just how exciting and fulfilling whitetail hunting can be. It's more about the interaction between you and the animal. And so I think that interaction that you have with deer and other animals and the ecosystems that they live in is what's most fulfilling, not pulling the trigger and harvesting an animal. There's this biological function, there's a social function, there's a huge family function, and there's just an identity thing. I have, um, I've done a lot of things, but I have the, the one thing that I've always identified as for my entire life, and most people in my family identify this way as well, we identify as hunters. Um, it's how we engage with and relate to the world around us. And the world around us is very important to us. And the world, the natural world around us is more important than all other aspects. If there's one thing hunters love more than the pursuit of wild game, it's eating the purest form of protein on the planet. So, you can't commercially sell white-tailed deer meat in the U.S., but I'm going to show you an example of how we prep other exotic venison cuts. Or uh, venison marsala. We are using a boneless leg fillet. So we're gonna get our cast iron pan hot. So my name is Skylar Stafford. I am the executive chef here at The Huntsman and one of the co-owners. So we're just gonna pan fry this. This is the boneless leg fillet. So we're gonna start building our sauce while the venison is cooking. The idea of the Huntsman, uh, we all grew up in restaurants together, the three of us. Um, you, we all worked really well together. We were looking for a different approach to Tallahassee and, and food in Tallahassee. Um, me and Ben grew up as you know hunting, fishing, all those things. Uh, so it seemed like a logical step. There's not many places in town that you can get game. It's a more ethical option compared to beef. I think people are looking for a healthier al alternative and we were able to, to deliver on that. So it's a pretty popular dish at the restaurant. We sell quite a lot of these. It's an easy way to use a cut that a lot of people aren't familiar with, a boneless leg filet. We take the filets, cut them down, uh, use it to carter and tenderize the meat, and then come back with a meat mallet, pound them all out, 
and then hit them with uh, seasoned flour, egg wash, and panko and herbs. Once you get away from any sort of stigma someone has regarding game meat and they try it, and then you explain, you know, where it comes from and why it's better, um, you know, it, it really hooks people. And then, you know, from there, people will try more adventurous cuts. More butter. I think for a lot of people not growing up hunting, things like that, you know, it was always, it's a very exotic, it's, you know, it's, it gets kind of put into this class where it's like, oh, it's not what we do. It's not really available at the grocery store. And for a lot of people, it's, it, they feel like it's an unattainable thing to get. Even if they want to try it, it's like, I, I've never hunted before. I don't know anybody that hunts. I don't even know how to get into this. Um, you know, dirty meat, I think there's a lot of perception of like the Bambi, like, oh, it's this cute, fuzzy animal. And, you know, we, we shouldn't do that. But, uh, you know, I think through this restaurant and, and the things that we offer, I think we've opened up a lot of people's eyes to this is a very good product. So our Marsala wine, we're gonna turn our flame to. We're gonna hit just a little bit of lemon on there and a couple pea tendrils from the local farm. Wild game including venison is a is a great deal of the diet of many Kentuckians. The vast majority of hunters hunt for one primary reason, and that's food. The cool thing is white-tailed deer provide something that is 100% organic in nature. Last year, data across North America showed about 6 million deer were harvested by hunters throughout the United States. If you assume every 50 pounds of venison provides 200 quarter pounders. That's literally 1.2 billion meals. My favorite part of deer anatomy is probably the backstrap because it's fantastic to eat. So, you know, I have ebbed and flowed in my desires as a deer hunter, but I get the most satisfaction out of, of feeding deer and eating venison, you know, to the, the non-hunter or friends and family. I love to, to bring people in and, and eat together. My motivations for hunting are clean, organic, locally sourced food that is um, something that I can feel good about putting into my body. You cannot find this at the grocery store. It's, you will never find deer at the grocery store. Um, you will never feel more do-it-yourself successful than when you harvest an animal. You dress it and clean it. You butcher it and you cook it and put it on your plate, you'll never feel more self-sufficient than when you do the whole process from A to Z, and then you really appreciate what it takes to put meat on the table. I feel anxious about a lot of things, but I do feel anxious about like being good. From that direction, we can see here, this is giving, this tree is giving us a little bit of cover. Um, which is good. You know, I think we all want to be good, you know, when we're trying out a new skill and like hitting the target right and like being in focus. Um, I think that's what I'm most anxious about. When I help Scarlett harvest her first deer, I will be so excited and so happy for her to see her go from not shooting at all, being able to, to shoot a rifle, get out into the woods and harvest a deer. Um, it will make me very excited for her and very happy to, to know that I was able to help someone and introduce someone new to the sport. The pursuit of white-tailed deer is in our human fabric. It's something we share, but when we choose not to share, disaster is often close behind. So many of the other large mammals that would have been on the landscape, okay, the, 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 the cougars, elk that were down there, a lot of people don't realize that, that there were bison in the southeastern U.S., um, very strong populations of black bears, there's still black bears scattered around, wolves, 
Um, timber wolves are gone, you know, red wolves are by and large gone. So you've had it where we've lost so many large mammals that the, that the white-tailed deer in some respects is the last man standing. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't understand that, uh, you know, historically there was commerce in wildlife and that's one of the reasons that, uh, you know, for example, deer and turkey, that's why the population suffered so much. And I like to tell folks that anytime you associate a monetary value with wildlife, wildlife is gonna lose out. This is also where man has played a key role in the rebound of species like the white-tailed deer through the use of laws and regulations to prevent the exploitation of America's wildlife. You know, in this country, uh, for the past century, hunters have carried, carried the lion's share of funding fish and wildlife management. When we stop and we think about the white-tailed deer hunter, uh, in the early 1900s, uh, as we were figuring out how do we fund important management responsibilities, key research, how do we get lands, public lands, for the public to utilize and for state fish and wildlife agencies to start taking that first step in wildlife restoration? In, in the southeast, it, it's a landscape that has in some measure been depleted by the activities of modern man. And so you have this, this, this vestige of that original wildlife there, that original wildness that I imagine speaks to people in a, in a heightened way that you might not find in other places where you have a more complete menagerie of, of native wildlife. The conservation dollars, I mean, without a doubt, I mean, hunters and fishermen uh, through their license sales, through you know the equipment that they buy, um, the gas, all of those things that they're doing you know while they're pursuing um, the species that they're hunting, that money goes directly to conservation. And it's not just conservation of whitetails, it's a lot of different species. And not just the species themselves, but the habitats. In addition to this, revenue is generated from the sale of guns and ammunition to hunters and also from the sale of hunting license. And this supports our state wildlife agencies. In turn, our state wildlife agencies are able to provide habitat improvements across the state. They're able to conserve lands for habitat improvements and for wildlife species. They provide funds for scientific research. It was always about taking care of what we had. I think being on a farm, certainly we learned early to take care of the animals, to take care of the land. And then so the wildlife part of that was always just a piece. Yeah, hey, we're going to be, we're hunters. We're going to eat these deer. We're going to eat these turkey. We're going to feed our families with them. But at the same time, we have to make sure that we take care of the land that they come from. The commercial hunting of the American bison, while turkeys and white-tailed deer nearly brought these species to extinction. In the 1900s, leaders like Teddy Roosevelt, Aldo Leopold, John Muir and the hunting and fishing community as a whole came together to make strides to protect and conserve wildlife and their habitats. This philosophy formed one of the greatest pieces of modern conservation, the North American model of wildlife conservation. It was in 1938 that the Pittman-Robertson Act was, was started by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And the Pittman-Robertson Act was, is, a, is a part of what we now call the North American model of wildlife conservation. So the North American model of wildlife conservation has seven tenets. The number one tenet is that the wildlife of North America belongs to the American people. The North American model of, of managing wildlife is certainly is much different than, than what you see in other countries. It's a, a wildlife being under common ownership, managed by uh, the state or the government for the benefit of all people. Whereas in other parts of the world, it's more of a, the landowner owns the wildlife to some degree. Wildlife is uh, a public resource. And we as state agencies uh, hold it in a trust, but the public gets to decide kind of what we do with it and how it's managed. The second tenet is that there's no more market hunting in North America, which means you cannot sell wildlife-related commodities. So the North American model eliminated commerce in dead wildlife. So there's, it removed a commercial value 
uh, for the exploitation of a wildlife species. One of the important tenets of the North American model for wildlife conservation is that you cannot harvest and then sell wildlife. And that is just a, one of many critical elements to that model that makes it work, that makes it, makes it successful. The third tenet is that wildlife is regulated by the democratic rule of law, which means that the people get to decide what happens with the wildlife. Tenet number four is that everybody has access to wildlife. So one of the tenets of the North American model is that wildlife is owned by the public. It's not owned privately. That's pretty unique to the United States. I think that it's something that we've got to uh, always keep in mind is that the, the wildlife that we all enjoy is owned by the public and it can't be privatized. It can't be uh, secured and, and held back by any one individual. And that's so critical because we came from a European model of wildlife conservation where wildlife was privatized and wildlife was essentially only hunted by the, by the rich and wealthy. <laughs> if you're trying to protect wildlife, it doesn't seem like you'd want to say, okay, everyone can hunt. But that's the American genius of our model. If I have no incentive, to protect those deer. If I can't hunt those deer, then I'm not gonna protect them. Where wildlife has value through hunting, that wildlife will be protected. The fifth tenet is the non-frivolous use of wildlife tenet, which means anytime that we kill an animal, there is a ethical, sound reason that we do it. So wanton waste is a regulation that ensures that animals that are harvested are consumed and used and so it is against the law to harvest uh, an animal and to not consume those commonly edible portions of the animal. Poaching then would be very similar to wanton waste in that you know you're taking animals you know you're not agreeing to the contract or the out the laws and regulations of that hunting license. The sixth tenet is that wildlife is an international resource and is managed as an international resource. And pretty much that means that wildlife does not know international boundaries. Uh, many of the American public may not realize that white-tailed deer is an international resource. It's highly abundant in Canada, all across the United States, and into Mexico, Central America, and even South America. Hunting has a big influence and impact on habitat management and harvest management in all those countries. These governments, Canada, United States and Mexico needed to work together on animals that crossed boundaries. The seventh tenet is that wildlife is managed by scientific means. Wildlife must be managed by science, and so not emotion, not by politics, so by science. Our entire organization, we make all of our decisions driven by solid peer-reviewed science. And so as long as we stick to that, as long as we keep politics out of it, then our wildlife has the best opportunity to thrive. Remember that Bass Pro Shops mega store? The North American model levies an 11% excise tax on hunting, ammunition, and shooting sports gear that goes directly to funding public lands and wildlife management. That means it's your state's hunters who are directly responsible for funding the conservation and protection of American wildlife. Ooh, my, 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 my. If hunting was outlawed, I think you would see conservation efforts plummet. I also think you would see funding for various conservation programs ended because some of the very conservation funds that the United States government shares with the states comes from the sales of guns, ammunition, fishing, you know, equipment, paraphernalia. So I think it would have a very adverse effect if hunting was outlawed. This means hunters and sports shooters are the ones to thank for the songbirds you hear and the butterflies you see. No other continent on earth has this model and it's why wildlife is so abundant here. Deer hunters don't just help the deer population, they're helping all those other wildlife species that are out there because the funds that deer hunters pump into our system in large part funds the majority of many of our state wildlife agency programs.
Yeah, so the Florida panther represents the only breeding population of puma east of the Mississippi River. And the story of the Florida panther is similar to other large predators in North America, such as the grizzly and the wolf. Historically, uh, pumas were, uh, a population of pumas in North America had a transcontinental distribution. Uh, by the late 19, 1890s, panthers had become extirpated uh, across eastern North America, except for a small population here in Florida. Deer hunting absolutely helped the panthers. Uh, in one way, the money from hunting licenses purchased from deer hunters goes into the budget of the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And with that money, FWC funds all kinds of wildlife conservation activities, including the conservation and management of species and habitats uh, and wildlife enforcement activities. The same type of management that we would typically recommend for deer in those lower in the lower coastal plain under those conditions would benefit the gopher tortoise, which is federally listed in the western portion of its range, so in Mississippi, for example, as well as the black pine snake, the dusky gopher frog, and the red cockaded woodpecker. And there are a number of other species that would benefit from these types of habitat improvements. In general, I study wildlife management as the Extension Wildlife Specialist at the University of Tennessee. I'm responsible for all types of questions that come in related to wildlife, but I concentrate mostly on applied land management practices that are used to influence and enhance habitat for different wildlife species. Beyond our public lands, hunters and land managers improve over 2 million acres of private land each year. Two million acres a year is like improving an entire Yellowstone National Park. And this is no average gardening task. It's tough work, but it has a generational effect on the wildlife and people. Like a tree being planted, it's the diligence of years of hard work that pay off for the generations to come. Every species benefits when you, when you go out and you, you plant habitat, whether it's a food plot or, again, it's a... Your goal was a na native tree, tree stand or timber stand. So we've got a wide variety of forbs and grasses in this field. This is one of the areas that we had restored. There's some Indian grass that you see in the background there. There's a lot of goldenrod. This is an, a pretty neat area that's got a pretty high diversity of forbs and grasses and it would be, you know, an ideal place for a deer to both bed down and to forage as well. Well, I think a lot of people would be surprised surprised to know how much work goes into managing deer population and there's a textbook behind me that's about this thick that's all about deer management so there's a lot of a lot of research that's gone into giving us the tools that we need to do it to so that we can ensure sustainability of the resource and provide an opportunity for our stakeholders to go out there and enjoy it there's no question of who has put in the blood sweat tears money everything into it and that is Hunters, we've raised the money, we've saved the wild places, we've transported deer all over the country. These Ozark deer that live in my backyard are the direct result of the reintroduction of probably less than 100 deer in the 1940s and 50s in a couple of different little uh, reintroduction projects that happened. The National Deer Association uh, is, is a national organization dedicated to ensuring the future of wild deer, wildlife habitat, and hunting. And as such, there is no conservation organization that fights harder for deer to ensure that we have healthy deer, do we have healthy habitats for those deer, and to fight for deer hunters to make sure that we have the opportunity to pursue those deer, that we have access to those animals. I wish that non-hunters understood that we truly do care about these animals and love white-tailed deer. Um, we, we put forward a lot of time and energy and money uh, and work to better the habitat for not only deer, um, but for other game and non-game species and that we, we use these animals to feed our families and that we, we love and respect these animals. The American hunter lives at the mercy or with the blessing of the American voter writ large. Okay, um, there, there's, a, there's a future scenario in which sentiment were to turn so strongly against hunting. We haven't seen this, and I don't see it on the immediate horizon. So strongly get hunting, uh, against hunting that hunting just in its broadest form becomes illegal. Um, that could happen down the road. 
if if hunters don't do uh, a sufficient job of explaining themselves and explaining their role in the culture and their role as wildlife managers. If hunting was outlawed, that'd be a devastating impact to wildlife conservation, whether you're a hunter or not. Considering hunters put $2.4 billion a year into wildlife management, and that benefits all species, not just white-tailed deer, that money would have to be made up somewhere else. And right now, we've not been successful in finding other sources of funding for wildlife conservation. So without hunters, where will these funds come from to help preserve and enhance wildlife? It's ironic, but the deer and their habitats would not be around today if not for the dollars, labor, and time of the men and women who pursue them. That's the elegance of our North American model of wildlife conservation. If hunting died out, it's not just like, well, shoot, I guess we can't shoot deer in our backyards anymore. It's not legal in the United States. No, the, the ramifications of hunters not being on this continent would be catastrophic to wild places, wild beasts, and the culture of this place, man. Like, take my people somewhere else if we can't hunt here. So when we went to go get the deer, we were in the stand, it was sunset, oh, it was so beautiful. There were orange and yellow colors all around. <laughs> but no deer for about an hour, an hour and a half. And then Mariah whispers, I see one. And then Kirsten whispers, I see two. And then Mariah goes, I see four. And I'm like, I don't see any. <laughs> And I truly could not see any of the deer. So I'm like fiddling around with the scope, trying to, you know, get, you know, my eyes on it. Could not see it for the life of me. The deer hide behind some bushes that are there. So we wait. Oh my gosh. Scarlet, you did it. And then Kirsten fell. Kirsten fell and suddenly there was a loud push and the deer lifted its head up and I said, oh my God. And Mariah said, this is the perfect shot. Broadside is out. If you have a clear shot, go ahead and take it. And honestly, I was feeling really nervous because I couldn't find the deer for like seven minutes. So I was like kind of shaking, but you know, I practiced deep breathing. I was like, okay, it's going to be fine. And then I just, you know, calmed my mind and I took the shot. You should be proud of yourself. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna invite all my friends that are so proud of me for being a huntress. Um, I showed them all my picture and they were like, Scarlett, you did not. And then I showed them and they were like,
so surprised. So we're all gonna have a big, great big gathering um, and a great dinner and they're gonna be so proud of me. Harvesting an animal is a heavy thing, but when we zoom out and see the bigger picture, it's not just about the single deer, but about the entire natural cycle, the circle of life that we all belong to, and about the wild places we've all shared for millennia. No matter how we engage in this cycle, as hunter, photographer, hiker, or backyard viewer, we're all taking and we're all giving. When we become advocates for the wild harvest of whitetail deer and the sustainable use of natural spaces, we're creating a world where deer and all wildlife can thrive and thrill us for generations yet to come.